Bene, buon pomeriggio, benvenuti. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Allora, c'è una realtà che... And that is a situation that we're very familiar with uh, here at the meeting that has always been working with the uh, ends of the earth. It was set up uh, just to carry out uh, its own function, i.e. to facilitate the growth of man, the development of man. That is AVSI, the uh, Voluntary Association for International Service. So this is an association that we're getting to know better, thanks to the exhibition that is here at the meeting, uh, Generating Beauty uh, is the title of the show. Well, they do live at the outskirts of the world, at the ends of the world, because they deal with development and they've always been doing so. And they certainly provide us with a good vantage point to understand the title of the meeting, to understand better uh, what the Pope meant to say when he said uh, we should go out there to the outskirts of the world uh, to get to know the ends of the earth uh, because what happens there can enable us uh, better to know uh, all the rest uh, to better understand reality as such. Well, the exhibition which is on again during these days and that I invite you to go see is a further contribution to that. And today we're going to hear from uh, uh, two parts of this world. Uh, the exhibition is about one lively reality. We're going to have Stefania Famlonga, uh, whom we'd like to welcome. Who is the manager for MC projects in Ecuador, where he has, she has been living for a number of years now. And such projects enable uh, or promote rather the growth of many people, many children, hundreds and hundreds of uh, children. And she's going to tell us about her job over there. You'll have to see the show to understand. Anyway, uh, Ecuador is one of the remote areas where they operate with... Uh, wealth of things happening and to discover. Things that should be actually taken and followed as an example of what we should do. And then we're up next to Ecuador, there's also Kenya and Brazil, San Paulo with a CREN that fight against malnutrition and especially about nutritional education. And then there's somebody who has visited this three situation and who has worked to put a to put together this show, and uh, this another long-time friend, uh, friend of the meeting, this is John Waters, whom I'd like to welcome as well. We've known him for years, uh, he's a journalist from Ireland, he's a really close friend of the meeting, and he visited what is being done in these faraway countries. And the show is not just showcasing something that has been going on for a number of years. The show indeed is an attempt to meet up with a challenge that after what uh, Julian Caron said, who is the president of the Fatal Brotherhood of uh, Communion and Liberation, when after a meeting with AFSI, he launched a provocation uh, to those who deal with peripheries and the ends of the words, ends of the earth. He, Caron said, and raised an issue there, he said, but m much energy was devoted and do you think that you contributed to having more development or rather more dependence on our crumbs? Do you think that you've triggered off something that can actually live as a man? Because basically what is most important to, to have development is to have the development of the individual. So throughout your project, do you think that you can contribute that? Do you, can you actually contribute to the birth of a man because if we don't have the human element in that there's no development whatsoever well AFSI is active there and they have analyzed their work based on this provocation by Julian Caron so having said as much I'd like to ask um, Stefania from Longa about her work there uh, her experience 
So do you think that you are contributing to the birth of new individuals that can actually tackle reality and live rather than just people who depend on uh, uh, help? Thank you very much. I'd like to give the floor to Stefania. Buongiorno a tutti. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stefania. I've lived in Ecuador in Quito for 11 years, and I work for ABSI. We work in a favelas called Pizuli in a marginal neighborhood of the capital city, Quito. Pizuli is located on top of a hill, 3,000 meters high, and it was invaded at the beginning, even in a violent way, by a small group of people, which then became thousands of people coming from the rest of the country to occupy those areas which were left abandoned to try and build a house and look for a job in the city and have some hope in life. The people in Pizuli live in very small houses. In most of the cases, it's the extended family that lives together. So parents, children, grandparents, uncles, aunts, they all live together in cement houses, in some cases wooden houses without basic services, sewage systems, proper roads, telephone, in some cases even without water and light. In a neighborhood which now has 15,000 inhabitants, we accompany on a daily basis 500 families and their children with remote support, remote assistance. Children can therefore go to nursery schools developed within the households. Then we accompany school children starting from primary school. We also accompany and support young people, but above all the parents in their task to educate, because in these less favored circumstances, it's easy to think you cannot do even the simplest things, like educating your own children. You think you don't have the necessary means for this purpose. In these neighborhoods, violence is spread out, especially on women and young people, together with drugs and arms. And also, violence is quite common in the daily relations. Men are abandoned to their reactions and instincts, looking for expedience to live their day without any project and hopes for the future. Violence often arises from the disappointment of life in the city, which is much more complex than you can imagine. You leave your own land, your own roots, and this generates a sense of mistrust and solitude among people. I'd like to tell you that living there in a geographical periphery, if I may say so, following the experience of communion and liberation, over the past years, I've seen the birth and rebirth of uh, people inside me and especially around me. If I were to summarize all this, I would say that uh, in the ends of existence, I found myself. During the years uh, at university, I studied pedagogy at the Catholic University in Milan. And this meant to me that I could have a special, uh, a decisive and deep encounter with the Christian experience. And I had a feeling that um, my sense of life and things was valid for everybody from the rest of the world. I, would, I could not imagine that I was going to spend so many years of my life outside Italy. I got to Ecuador in 2003, not because of choice, but obedience. Some older friends asked me whether I wanted to go there, and I was fascinated by this experience. It's, it was all about serving the church through the presence of the Movement of Communion and Liberation and Memories Domini, the Association of Consecrated Lay People. And, um, I had always had this um, as a desire since I met 
the Christian experience, but it was not easy. After a few months, thanks to APSI, I started having a job and I started working in Quito. As David has said, all this is displayed in the exhibition. Before going to Ecuador, I worked in Romania for APSI. I worked with poor people there and I thought, I knew what poverty meant. I thought I knew something about poverty and life itself. Actually, during the first months in Quito, that's um, how I lived. I thought I knew what to do to help the others. And this was made easier to me by the fact that I had spent so many years in Romania and also within the experience of communion and liberation. But I thought uh, that being European, I knew more. And also within APSI, we had the economic um, resources, we had assets, um, and this um, makes you feel a bit superior. When I got there, after a few months, I met Amparito, who many of you, I suppose, know. The first person from Pisuli, from this uh, neighborhood, uh, with whom we started working in Quito. Amparito gave his uh, testimony at the meeting in 2009. It was a moving testimony of his uh, life, um, of her life and rebirth. Uh, she's one of my dearest friends. Um, when I met her and the first women who started to work with us, it was a great experience. So we were not thinking of working with the women from that neighborhood. We were looking for specialists, but nobody was ready to come and work there. They were all afraid. When I started meeting those uh, women, I remember I was very much impressed by their interest and openness towards me and by what I was proposing, that is, working with the families. I saw genuine humanity and naive humanity among these young people, among these young women, people with no prejudices in spite of the discomfort in which they were living and that they were experiencing and in spite of the violence behind them. Many of them had not completed primary school either because of many reasons and yet all these women had um, a great deal of humanity, which I was lacking. Everything started to change in me then. I remember one day a great friend of ours, Carras, came to visit us in Pizzoli to meet them. We were then only five, and now it's about 40 of us living, uh, working there. Carras, um, during that um, dialogue, rather informal one, started talking about life. Um, the sense of things um, and the sense of life and the meaning of life and then he started talking about Jesus and these women seemed to understand they were quite astonished I remember that day at the end of that encounter I approached Karas and told him you know I can't believe it I can't believe that those women can understand and experience um, the same that I do because you see they've not studied they are a bit sentimental. Instead, we Europeans uh, rely so much on reason and are not so sentimental. And then, you know, in Quito, in Ecuador, life is so different. At some point, he looked at me and told me, Steffi, you know, these women are um, the, like the first people who encountered Jesus. They were fishermen. They had not studied, but their life was so full of drama that they needed that man in order to live. Maybe they could not understand all that that man was telling them. Some of those words remained fixed in their heads and minds and were sufficient to enlighten all their lives. I was struck by that short dialogue and started to understand that there was something new and important to discover for my life, my work and my vocation. The competencies I had, the know-how, the experience I had gained, and the material resources we had available were no, not enough, no longer enough to explain my presence there, which was not even the most important thing. 
I started spending time with those women with a desire to learn from them because I saw that there was awareness of their needs in them, not just material needs, but also interior needs, uh, the needs of the soul. They were humble and they were willing and eager to learn everything both at work and in life as a whole. And they had a dramatic sense of uh, living um, and a great uh, sense of sacrifice. And, and they could simply recognize what was true. This is something I did not have. Cathy was one of the first of those women. She still works with us. She is a mother of three daughters. I remember that in the first interview we had, she told me, well, I don't really understand what you're proposing to me. And I like children. I don't like the adults. I don't like the mothers. You know, above all, we work with mothers. But you are the person from abroad. You are the foreigner. You've come such a long distance to help my people, so I'd like to help you. I was struck by this immediate, immediate ability to recognize uh, the truth and uh, the ease with which she said she would support me and work with me. I saw some naiveness uh, in um, her eyes. I was not aware of this then, but um, with hindsight, I think that uh, she had uh, to be made aware of uh, certain things. And I had encountered a lot of things in my life. I was given a lot of things, uh, among them also Christianity in, an al in a live form, so I could help them uh, raise awareness of their humanity and their great spirit. It was all within themselves because value is inside us and not outside. But the greatest discovery of those times was realizing that what I had encountered, that is Christianity in a live form, was something that I did not own then. It was not totally mine. I thought I had understood this the way you understand um, a theory, but um, spending time with those women, I realized that it was not like this. I had to continue learning this in my life so as to change and change them. And I could learn this uh, together with those people. We began with the famous um, meetings um, on Monday morning. Those m are meetings in which, uh, with the family educators, uh, we discuss uh, several uh, subjects, including work and very often life. Work has to do with uh, life and uh, the community. During these meetings, we read together some texts which have to do with education, charity, and um, life. These are um, texts um, by Father Giussani and uh, Julian Caron. All women say that during these moments, they start um, looking inside themselves uh, and um, rediscover much of their persons. Uh, many of them um, were the subject of violence uh, by their husbands. Now they don't accept this anymore. Thanks to these meetings, they started tackling reality and examined also mistakes made with their children. Um, the very fact of working, and most of them had never worked before, um, gave them strength. Um, and also they became aware of being uh, women um, and that being a woman was not just, uh, did not just mean uh, uh, becoming pregnant and having children, but uh, something more. So they developed a desire to start studying. Certainly, I've seen myself change a lot during these years, and I've seen them change, and together with them, their husbands, their families, their neighbors, because society, as we try to convey through the exhibition, changes 
one by one um, as um, if there was uh, something contagious, uh, some sort of contagious fever. I've seen um, people uh, being born again, um, no longer under the burden of their past. Let me just go through two uh, testimonies uh, which impressed me very much. Um, they're all included in a book um, of the witnesses um, collected by John. Um, one of these is a, a testimony of Sylvia, who left um, her husband because of violence and uh, drugs. Uh, she is 33 and has five children. I went to see her in her own uh, house, um, a few square meters with wooden walls, a few beds uh, and a gas-fueled uh, kitchen, and also a desk uh, where she studied all evenings uh, together with her children. She had started primary school again after meeting us. She was eager to complete her studies. And beside her bed, there was a small chair, and on top of it, Giussani's book, Can You Live Like This? And she told me, you see, Steffi, every evening when I go to bed, I read a, pass a passage of this book, and I try to read it also to my husband. She said, Previously in my life, I had no purpose because I had my husband and I thought this was all. I thought the only thing I was supposed to be was being a mother and a um, wife dealing with her own children. But when I arrived here and following my curiosity, I met uh, different people with a different um, view on things. They were happy to see me. I liked their friendship and affection. I did not let myself go right from the beginning because I didn't thought someone could be interested in my life. Then I started seeing my life as a only one thing. It was a very strong experience. I received everything. I was offered a job. I was offered friendship. And I met a presence which implied even more. At the end, I was able to see what I want it to be, a different person. I'm grateful to this place because without uh, the others, uh, I would never have been able to educate myself and I would have lost my children. I would have not had the courage to trust myself, but staying here with Amparito and Steffi gave me the courage to understand that God is here. Another example is that of Alba. She's 50, and she's been working with us for six years. In John's interview, she said, my life has changed. The relationship with my husband, with my brothers and sisters is better. It's the best experience you can have in your life, understanding who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. Now I can freely speak about nice things inside us. They're still there, but we have to learn how to see them. I had to look inside myself, and this is what I'm doing with my mothers. It's easier to speak about somebody else's life instead of yours. I hope one day comes in which this is easier, because there is a lot of solitude and sadness among us. And the first um, um, we tend to forget is ourselves. It took me a long time to understand that the problem was not outside us. It was not the others. It was myself. In the past, the problems used to crush me. But when I started to see that I could still walk and see, I started doing this. I don't think God has created us and then abandoned us on earth. He left his seeds inside us. Hope is inside us. We have to look for it and find it to be able to walk again. You can walk, you can live, you can um, go away, but the encounter with a true path, uh, finding truth, is something different. Uh, you still, you're still what you used to be, but with a new meaning. Uh, what I you. What I used to say to my mothers is, I have changed. I've changed, but not because I wanted this. I changed because I met someone who pushed me to change. I used to say that I would become this or that, and I thought I would have reached my ideas only with strength. 
You can only do this if you have someone to follow, if you leave your burdens behind and know how to go on. Our feet have to guide us in this path. Our feet have to lead us towards the truth, what moves us, um, what drives us, that is being happy. This is what God wants from us. One of the mothers said something nice once. She said, I'm going to change too, not because I want it, but because I've seen the truth in you. I think this is nice, says Alba. I'm happy to be one of the protagonists of change in um, this periphery, in these outskirts. This is the change I have seen and experienced a desire to be yourself, um, what you were made for, and the reason you exist in the world in order to make a positive contribution to the rest of the world. But without a human encounter with a good um, and nice gaze on us, um, with the flavor of mercy and forgiveness, this is almost impossible. Marta, an educator of ours, says that staying with us, she knew a new God, a good God, because uh, to her God was only a punisher. And above all, I've seen um, hope um, rise again. As far as I could see, hope is not only that um, with a with job security, you can have a better house um, and you can give something better to your children, but hope is um, hope towards oneself, um, trying to meet uh, someone with significance um, so that you can say, I can study, I can change, I can forgive, I can love myself, and above all the others, I can do something good and useful to the rest of the world. There is something mysterious in me, our heart, we have repeated this so often these days. Um, and it is this heart that pushes me forward um, and allows me to stand up even when I fall. A mother told us after some days, as you can see from the exhibition, you, we don't want you to help us um, doing our children's homework, but we want to help our children. So help us. Um, help our children do their homework. And uh, in Ecuador, similarly to Kenya or Brazil, um, uh, society changes if one changes and uh, this contagion spreads out. John has uh, given us a testimony of this through the exhibition. I was moved also by John's behavior. It's the educators, those that are in the forefront, those that are not afraid of putting themselves at stake that are most important. In 2011, after Caron came to the meeting mentioned by Davide before, sent a challenge to us, gave us a challenge and asked us to wonder whether what we were doing was really helping these individuals to grow. I was here in Italy with Amparito. We returned to Quito, and at the first meeting on Monday, we said, you know, we can't fool ourselves. I don't want to fool myself trying to insist keeping my job, because this is what was all about. I said, I don't want to fool myself, I don't want to fool you or cheat you, and you shouldn't do this with um, our people. So I told them, what is it among all the things we do that is really useful? What is it that changes, intimately changes man? I wanted to understand this. I remember their faces. They were all surprised. And one after the other, they said, Steffi, what changed us was what you tell us on um, during the meetings on Mondays. And we want to start saying this to all our families. And so we started working on the educational risk, taking as a basis the text written by Father Giussani. We we printed 500 uh, copies in a small size, uh, and it's quite moving to see our mothers 
walking in the streets of Pizzoli with a lot of um, dust with this book in their hands uh, when they come to the meetings. Uh, up to some years ago, some of them did not even know how to read and write. That book, um, the, the words of that book are full of life, uh, both to me and to them. We don't understand everything, but what we understand is what we need to live. And when John came to visit us, something that impressed me was that he said, when they speak, these women speak of an experience and not of a discourse. So very often I say to myself, that this is most true. Four years ago, I came to Italy for a course, an APSI course, and I wondered if our task as an NGO is that of allowing people to grow and we are attaining that goal. And many of these people were able to know Christ, the Christian experience. They approached the Christian experience giving value back to their tradition because Ecuador is a Catholic country, I asked myself, if we have achieved our goal, isn't it time perhaps to go away? I remember I spoke about this with many people in Ecuador and also here in Italy. Vitadini came to an APSI meeting and I asked him this question and he answered, maybe the nice thing is precisely now. Steffi, imagine how many things you can continue doing and how much help you can continue giving. Life, Steffi, is much more about sharing than succeeding. I still remember that sentence, and at that very moment, I started having a different concept of, the, of myself and the relationships I have with the others. And this year, I understood that life is nice because you walk together with others. You don't walk in front and all the others behind, but you walk together with the others. And um, from a certain moment on, you're all on an equal footing with companions given to you by God. We're all together in front of the mystery where we're all the same. We're poor and in need with the same need to be saved. Two years ago, we were struck by the crisis, and for the first time, I was faced with the risk of losing my job. Many questions came spontaneously to me, but basically one, what is our contribution to the world as an NGO, which in the name of the economic resources that we have available and the know-how that we have available is trying to help the others. It was a fundamental question to me, and you know, given the scarcity of economic resources and the fact that Ecuador is a country which is making considerable steps forward from all points of view and it's no longer a third world country, I saw that um, you know, many NGOs were closing and missionaries were leaving the country because they told me we have already given the country what we could, what, what we could, as much as we could. But I wondered, uh, when will I ever be able to say that I've given this country as much as I could? But uh, amidst this, um, there was um, a change in the organization of um, um, work. Amparito um, became the director of the local foundation that AFSI and CESAL helped grow because helping people grow also means that you allow organizations to be formed and grow. Amparito is the person I had started all my work with. She, at some point, became my boss. This was uh, really turning things the other way around. It was a big change. Uh, you know, we are friends and we are on an equal footing in front of the mystery. You know, being at the top or at the bottom, what is it 
for unless you serve a reality, the one which is given to you by God in the form that he gives it to you. Another nice thing we've, we discovered during this past year, and I'm not presumptuous uh, saying this, is that in spite of our um, inabilities and limits, we have something that other NGOs do not have. It's like a treasure. As we discover this treasure, we understand that the world needs uh, this. Well, Equ in Ecuador, the state is very strong. Uh, initially, we thought uh, we were bound to disappear because all services that we provide are also given by the state. Instead, we started um, a dialogue with the government, with the state. We started discussing with them, reflecting and reasoning to understand what we are providing. And um, we have understood that the state cannot reach real people, um, accompany them and educating them to cover the last mile without which there can be no change in society. That's why the police and the municipalities um, uh, call us to enter the community because sometimes they are afraid of certain people um, or simply they want to know their needs. In September last year, Julian Caron visited us in Ecuador. He came to Pizzoli one morning. We welcomed him with music and dances, and then there was a meeting with the educators. And several times while visiting us, he would say, uh, what a marvel, it's wonderful. I'm coming from 14 thousand kilometers away at 3,500 kilometers altitude because we are in the Andes to discover that what I experience and live in Italy is true because these women were able to change with dignity, a dignity that we often dream of. I was then in a critical moment of my life. I was a bit tired. Perhaps I was used to what I was doing, and I took many things for granted. So I came closer, went closer to him and said, you know, not all of them have become Christian. Not all of them have converted. Not all of them recognize Jesus. They're not all part of the uh, communion and liberation movement, uh, but he said, Steffi, there are many people uh, who talk about Christ and don't say I as these women say. Here we see exactly the opposite of what is usually the case. We talk about uh, Christ, but this has nothing to do with the way we say I. Here, everything has happened. Even the apostles uh, meeting Jesus uh, could not say that they had met the Son of God immediately the day after meeting him. It, and some time was necessary for them to say this. So I had to shift my gaze and um, understand that the proof and evidence that there is a Christ is this uh, um, continuous um, rising of the person in me and around me. I met um, Christ almost uh, 27 years ago, but in the last few years in Ecuador, I really discovered how Christ allows uh, human beings to flourish. I'm particularly grateful for this. I discovered how large humanity is and uh, how huge Christ is. Diego is 27. I'm, say, I'm saying this because it may seem that what I've said so far is only true for women instead. No. Diego is uh, a memorist um, and the nephew of Amparito. Five years ago, his best friend, the brother of Amparito, was uh, killed. Diego uh, had known us, and on the day of, on the evening of the funeral, he called Amparito and told her, I've seen your friends suffer for Jose, the way that not even our family was uh, suffering. I want to live this uh, friendship the way you do it. Or Alexander, a 22-year-old boy who has received a grant to attend university, the University of the Rich in Quito. He's studying 
studying graphic design. Um, I asked him, are you sure? Uh, do you... Um, uh, do you like it there? Also because there was a disparity with the other students belonging to a higher social class. You can see this also in the color of the skin. I asked him, um, do you like it there? He told me, look, Steffi, all the other guys have everything. They don't make the sacrifices that I make to go to a university. They also smoke marijuana, but they're not happy. I am. And uh, me too, like Alexander, say I am also happy with him. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie, Steffi. Thank you very much, Steffi. Now, John, you visited Pizzuli. You visited uh, the uh, preschool where the women educate their children. You spent some time there. You spent also some time in Kenya and in Brazil. Uh, you've interviewed many people. You've seen these things with your own eyes. What have you learned? What have you learned about reality and about yourself? And has anything changed in you? Well, uh, I was asked to do this by AFSI, uh, uh, this project, uh, uh, to uh, really go and uh, look as an outsider at these projects and, and uh, to uh, make a judgment about them and to produce, help to produce this exhibition. And, uh, you know, my qualifications for this are really that uh, I have been uh, living in this world for uh, quite a while and uh, I have no particular competence in the area of poverty indeed. Um, I'm interested in the, interested in the concept of poverty because uh, I'm a human being and also because I come from a place, uh, a background which from certain perspectives might seem to have been poor. Um, they were in our family, our parents and four of us, four children, and, and uh, we lived in two rooms in the west of Ireland in a, in a town but without electricity, without running water and for quite a number of years in my childhood. and. Uh, uh, in material terms, we would appear to be poor, but never for a moment did I think we were poor. It really was not a word that uh, I would have used uh, about myself or heard anybody use about us. Uh, my father uh, always uh, encouraged us. He always had uh, books in the house. He, he used to buy books and, and bring them home and, and leave them for us to read. Or. Maybe he didn't want us to read them all, but uh, we read them, and I read them as a child. And um, uh, they were poor people, uh, and they were different to us. They seemed to be people who it was agreed they felt they were poor. But they, society declared them poor, and there was something. But I, I have never been able to specify for myself what are the criteria of poverty. Uh, I have uh, been in Africa in many, in several countries, and, and looked at this, looked at the, the kind of economic definition we use and the, the, the remedies that we apply, um, aid, money, um, and I've seen this fail time and again in different countries. Uh, I have seen different approaches. I have friends in Ireland who work in Malawi to make wells uh, and uh, gardens with the people in, in there, and, and they have a different approach, but it's not in any way consciously described and so I was very interested to come to these places and and see what exactly am I uh, what is the nature of this problem what is the nature of the question uh, and I, I came I suppose with many open mind to a large degree uh, but also certain presumptions um, that you know poverty fundamentally is a material uh, phenomenon um, this would have been my prejudice certainly when I started out and and uh, that somebody must be missing something, um, some uh, analysis, some uh, ideological insight, uh, maybe even you know a proposal for a new system. Uh, perhaps I thought I will become the person who will uh, invent a new system to save the world out of all this. This is always the the 
where we start, I suppose. I certainly, where I start in my fragility. Um, and so I went with these questions in my mind. And, and uh, first of all, we went to uh, Ecuador, to Quito, to Pisoli, this invasion, so, uh, this place which is a, really a new civilization starting from scratch in the last 35 years, 30 odd years, um, beginning again. Uh, people who have come down from the countryside into this place, uh, they pitched their tent, they guarded it with a gun, they fought uh, their corner, they claimed their land, and they were joined by their friends and relations. Um, and they started again, a new life. And then later, Stephanie arrived and, and to started this, Stephanie started this new proposal. And this was part of what I was also given, the ingredients of our, our, our provocation, education, uh, the risk of education, Father Giussani and his uh, charism, uh, which is to put the uh, person, the student, at the very heart of the educative press process. Uh, what does this mean? I, I, I wasn't clear to begin with. Uh, I had read the book uh, several times, but uh, it remained uh, somewhat theoretical. Um, so I, I didn't know what to expect, really. Um, uh, poverty, obviously, again, in all of these places. I wasn't sure what... Uh, these three places were given to me, Ecuador, uh, Kenya and Brazil. Each project was proposed by AFSI and I accepted it without any question. I, I, I was open to see what the connections would be. I didn't know. Nobody said there were connections. I, I assumed we would find some. So, uh, uh, we began in Ecuador, in Quito, in Pisoli, and, and uh, there I was really uh, uh, astonished uh, to meet the women that uh, Steffi talks about, um, and Perito and the others, to see the self-possession of them, really. Uh, I mean, I had, uh, I had experience of poverty in many places, uh, pe poor people. I have a certain prejudice, I suppose we all have a certain prejudice about what a poor person looks like, how they behave how we behave towards them, you know, are we, uh, do we condescend, do we patronize, how do we, do we see them as uh, somebody in need of help, somebody dependent, somebody maybe beneath us in a way, I think so perhaps, you know, and, and uh, but these women were, were not like that, uh, in the room with them, uh, they were, they were completely in possession of themselves, with their children behind playing, the mothers would talk among themselves about great things, about Giussani's book, The Risk of Education, for example. Uh, and, and even if you didn't understand their language, you would have to say that these were extraordinary women from anywhere. No matter in what context you would see them, you would have to stop and look and listen and say, what is going on here? What, these are, these are poor women? I don't believe it. And, and when we interviewed them, there was something really which jumped out at me all the time. And, and, and I have to make a confession here, because I don't have very good Spanish, so I can understand a little, but not enough to really follow a, a, an argument or a, a point of view or a story. And, and uh, so I had to have a translator after the in each interview to tell me what was in the interview. And really, I have to confess something unprofessional, that in many of the interviews which we did in, in Quito, uh, I didn't wait for the translation. Uh, because all I had to do was look at the woman and know that she was telling everything. Uh, she would really, yeah, I knew, I, they would say, do you need me to tell you what she said? No, I, I, I've heard everything. I know what she said. Because the woman's face would tell everything. You didn't need it. And if you go to the exhibition and look at the, 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 the tapes, the look at the video, you will feel this. You can see, even though there is a translation every, in Italian, you don't need it. You see these women, they are alive in the fullest way. It's, it's, it is absolutely incredible. So I knew that I already uh, that there was something strange and unexpected happening. This was not a, you know, just good people doing good work. There was something really here that was uh, significant and, and functional. It worked. This worked in some strange way that I didn't understand. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm interested... Uh, I, I think uh, uh, at the end of uh, the, the journey uh, to uh, Ecuador, I was, you know, thinking and processing all of the things that had happened, all of the people we'd met, all the people we'd spoken to, and I, had I was already coming to certain uh, provisional, preliminary conclusions, um, uh, trying to, you know, find the story, find the story as we do, as journalists, that's what we do, we're way, you know, but always revising, revising, revisiting 
always remaining open to the next uh, discovery. And at that point, at the end of, of Ecuador, I think if you had asked me, I would have said, ah, this is a very interesting project. Um, this uh, charism of Gisani works very, really, really well for women. It works, the women really were animated beyond belief. The men, some of them, one or two, Diego, certainly. But the most men I, we spoke to in the, 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 were more, I think, abstract. They understood the principles and the, how it worked, but it didn't seem to inhabit their hearts in the same way. Uh, and, and I wondered then about the boys who were running around amongst the little girls in the play schools. And, and uh, What was the future for them? Is there, is there something we've missed here? Is there something we need to explore? And I wasn't sure if this would be a part of the exhibition. It actually isn't, because it's an open question. Um, because then, when I went to uh, Nairobi, uh, you know, because I, I came away from Ecuador thinking, you know, uh, men have a theoretical grasp. You know, I, I'm a man, so I, I need a theory too. So this was my theory, that uh, this uh, works for women, but maybe not for men. So I went to Nairobi, and there I found the opposite. Here it was men who were really the beginners, the originators of the, the, the project. Uh, Anthony, the, uh, the principal of uh, Little Prince School, Joaquin, the principal of Cardinal Otunga Secondary School, Cyprian, whom we met in Mutuati, a couple of hundred miles down the country. And uh, really, these men were extraordinary, uh, in the same way as the women that we'd met, the, the, whom uh, uh, Stefani has spoken about. These men, first of all. But also, their students were extraordinary, and in particular, the boys, because uh, really, uh, even though the girls, yes, they got it, and they, they, uh, they, but the boys were animated in Nairobi in exactly the way that the women in, in uh, Ecuador were, which was really astonishing. We met some really amazing people. Uh, uh, a, little, a boy called uh, uh, Ignatius, who was uh, an actor, who was going to be an actor, and, and you know, you, if you watch the video in the uh, exhibition of him on the, uh, on the wall, uh, on the first wall you see on the right-hand side, um, he says at one point that he is going to be the, the president of uh, his country. And it, it, it's not in doubt. It's not, it's not said frivolously. He believes that this is going to happen, and I, I personally don't think it can be stopped. Uh, this boy is so confident in himself. He has inhabited himself in such a way that it's impossible to say anything he says is not going to happen. So, really there were some, you know, amazing things. In the exhibition, the way we present it, and it's, it's an accident insofar as there is a, such a thing as an accident. Uh, normally when you start to uh, analyze something, you, you begin with the problem, and you define the problem and then you move towards a solution. For some reason this exhibition has ended up the other way around. Uh, the problem is defined at the end, uh, in a sort of way, in a way. But at the beginning, if you walk up in towards the, you will see a boy smiling at you from a poster looking out of the exhibition. And this is the, I won't say the solution, but it is the answer to this question of poverty. This boy has, is, is smiling the answer because this boy has been embraced by something. This boy is moving towards a horizon which he is confident about, which is inviting him forward. He knows it is there. He, he is not, uh, behind him is the, the slum of Kibera, which is really t the, one of the most terrible places I've ever been in my life. You know, it's, uh, you can see the video. It's uh, mud huts, uh, open sewers, uh, really rubbish everywhere. Uh, a million people on the side of a hill. Really, it's amazing. And this boy is walking out towards the school and he is like a boy anywhere. Happier than any boy you will ever see in uh, your own country, in this country, in my country. And then I see the, the, these teachers that they go, the, the beauty that they generate in these people, help to generate in these, these children. You know, and the beauty in many ways. Uh, we can talk about beauty as uh, the, uh, the aesthetic uh, quality, which is important in this context, because the schools themselves are beautiful. They are clean, they are spotless, shining. The windows are open and fresh and clean, and the air comes in, the sunlight comes in. These children are smiling and happy, laughing, talking. And uh, really it's impressed upon them at all times that this beauty, but also this beauty reflects an inner beauty. This is the, uh, which you can see emerging in this context from the children. Something else is there, something else is present, something else has happened to these children. It's not just uh, aesthetics, uh, it's not just the surroundings. Uh, these children have been looked at uh, by somebody. 
they have been told that they are uh, unique, they have been told that they are beautiful, they have been told that they are vital to this world and they believe, have come to believe it. And I was very, uh, very, very struck the other day by, by Gisela from Brazil was there and she said to me, uh, you know, there's one thing I, we, we, we should have said, that poverty is a lie. Poverty is a lie that the world tells you in order to convince you that you need things for your happiness that you haven't got. And I thought, yeah. But then I said, but these children, these people have been told the truth about themselves. They know the truth of themselves. That, that's the difference, that's the beauty that is generated in them. And I asked, uh, uh, many times I asked people in, the, in these projects, the teachers, um, the educators, those involved, well, how, how, do, how do you do this? What is the method, really? Um, and always the answer was the same. And, and uh, Joachim uh, from uh, Cardinal Tonga put it, I think, most beautifully. I said, and, and every time I see it on the video, it makes me almost cry. Because he says, I changed myself. It begins with me. I change in front of these children and they change because they see it is possible. I, I paraphrase what he says, but this is really the meaning. Uh, and that, that, I think, for us, for me, that was really the most important lesson, really, because I went with some, I don't know, uh, sense that I would discover some systems, uh, that I would see in all of this some system that everybody else had missed, uh, and that I would uh, develop it and, and we would solve all these problems. I changed myself. You know, it's a simple thing, but the greatest thing. So, uh, then we went to Sao Paulo, and, and uh, here we got to the nub of the question, really, of poverty. What is poverty? Um, because, uh, you know, I would have gone there with the economic analysis, as I said. You know, I would have gone there with a the sense that, okay, of course, there are uh, complications, complexities, but really, fundamentally, it's a resource question. Poverty, the resolution of poverty is a question of resources and, and uh, money. And I, I don't say that this is not a part of it, but there is something far more. Um, it has often struck me in, in, in my role as a journalist and being involved in these discussions in my own country in Ireland, talking about poverty and the insistence upon of certain people that equality is the answer to poverty. And it has always seemed to me strange that if you say that equality is the answer to poverty and it is the only answer, then you are offering the poor a solution that is impossible. And you were saying to the poor person, I condemn you, I condemn you so that I can sound good. I condemn you so that my ideology can remain and your poverty will remain also. And this has never satisfied me. It has always made me unsettled that we must look deeper. Uh, and so in, in Sao Paulo we met Gisela and uh, the others, Anna Lydia and, and these people who had devoted their lives to looking at poverty in its almost under a microscope and um, their speciality is nutrition and the words, you know, that we met new words there that were unexpected. Mm. Nutrition is affection, Gisela said. Well, what does this mean? What a sensational statement. Nutrition is affection. And then poverty is loneliness. Poverty is amnesia. What does this mean? Well, what we discovered is that, it, that there is a pattern to the experiences that, that, that they encounter at Crenn in, in uh, Sao Paulo. That uh, the families that come to them, the mothers, almost invariably the same conditions apply. That, that they are w w women, families which have been displaced from the country, they have come to the favelas, they have uh, lived there. They're not, they're not materially poor in the absolute sense, comparatively, yes but not in the sense that they don't uh, have uh, the means to buy food. But something happens, they have a child and, and for a while it's okay. The child is normal, the child is breastfeeding, so it's, everything is okay. But at the moment when the they try to wean the child, something begins to happen. The child maybe doesn't take the food they offer uh, and they don't know what to do. 
so they give the, the child the food that the child wants and will, will eat. But then the child begins almost to waste away before their eyes and they don't know what's happened and they feel a guilt and a shame about this, a terror. And uh, those of us who are parents can really identify with this in different ways, but you know, we have all had questions and issues with our children. You know, asthma, my child has asthma. I mean, as a child, she had asthma. What to do with this? You know, the, is it something I am doing wrong? Uh, you know, some people have problems, their child wets the bed for many years. They don't know what to do about this and they feel panic stricken. And the last thing they want to do is talk to somebody. Because, and, and, and imagine if you don't have somebody to talk to. Uh, what do you do then? So you be, the terror and the, the, the anxiety and the, the uh, guilt and the shame bottle, are bottled up in you. And this is really where we got to the, the really the heart of this question of poverty and, and, and the embrace which, which is offered in these projects in, in Ecuador, in uh, Kenya and, and in Brazil. That uh, these women f in, find their way to, to Kren and they meet Gisela and the others and they find suddenly that there is a place where they can breathe again. They can sit in relief to know that their problem is not definitive, it is not final. The, the problem can be resolved. Their child will be okay. There is a method, there is a way to do it. There is an understanding which they don't have. And you, you know, the interviews we did with those women are really moving beyond belief because you can feel their sense of gratitude and, and, and uh, joy uh, at the realization that this was possible for them and their children. So, really what I learned was, you know, that poverty is mu much more. It is not, it, it, at some point in the equation, there is a, a tiny factor which is material. I think there's no doubt about that. And, and, you know, I don't say that that's in our terms, in any terms, that it's a small matter. I think certainly we have to consider the material factor. But if you give, the, we have noticed many times in Africa that you, you throw money at the problem of poverty at, uh, in the form of aid and it does nothing. It disappears. It creates corruption. It feeds corruption. It leaves the, the, the people more dependent than in the beginning. Uh, so there's something. The, the money, the material aid on its own is, is useless. Without the embrace, it is a, a waste of time worse than a waste of time. Because, why? Because poverty is a wound. Poverty is a wound that begins with the blow in which, of which a part is the material. Maybe if you think of a, a blow with a fist and there is a ring on the fist that leaves a mark and that's the, 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 the material. But the blow, to be seen, to feel the blow, to, feel, to be seen, to be hit in this way, there is that, with that humiliation there is a, a, a marginalization, there is a, a shame. Um, and that is what is really, uh, when you begin to think like this, you begin to, I think, enter into the question of poverty, really. What is poverty? Because this humiliation is handed on parent to child, to child, to child. It persists in families generation after generation. And, and this, I realized looking back to my childhood, this is what distinguished us, our family, from the others that, that were poor. That we hadn't believed that we were poor. We hadn't felt the blow. They had felt the blow and, and you could see it in their eyes because they couldn't look at the world squarely. And really, at the beginning, uh, Julian Caron's uh, quotation of the exhibition where he talks about the importance of the gaze, the gaze, really, quite literally, that you, as the Pope says, it is not enough to give the money, you have to look into the eyes of the poor person. Not out of sentimentality, not out of uh, a sense of paternalism, but no, you, to vivify, to revivify the person, to say, come back into the family, you are, you are one of, you are like me. We are together, really, really we are together. Um, this is the meaning of that, I, I, you know, and, and that there is a promise in that. It's not just a, a throwaway comment. I just don't throw you the money to buy my relief uh, of my conscience, smile at you, pat your head and walk away. No, there is a promise. What is the promise? The promise is not that I will come back with more money tomorrow. It, it's not that I will uh, uh, start a development agency and... and, and uh, no, the promise is that I will change. 
I will change myself. This is the thing. And this is what we have really, in the exhibition, for me, at the back of, our, of my mind was this, that who, you know, the person who would walk through the exhibition and walk through, and what, what walking out, say, okay, well, it's interesting, but what? What for me? Because, as I say, there is no system. There is only the one person facing another, and what happens between them. And that person may be poor in the material sense, they may be poor in another sense. You may be poor. Maybe they are the rich one who can look at you. Because their poverty is a richness also that you need. So this, I came away knowing there's no system except this. That which we must one on one look at each other really. And we have, and we give each other this promise that today we may not know. We may, we may be stupid, we may be slow, we may be ignorant about what is really wrong between us, but we will change. I don't know how, I don't know what the next step is. I, will, I am open to this, I will wait for the next step. And we will change. And we will go out in search of people who, and, you, and, and be this person. Because really, somebody asked me today, you know, how do you, how do you translate this into a Christian, for a Christian school, what do you say? What is the core of this? What is the nature of this encounter, the gaze, the, the embrace? Well, it is really uh, that the child or the, the other person, that we look at them. We look at them, we embrace them as if they were Christ. With the Christ in ourselves, even when we don't understand fully what this means. Because that's, that's how we're made. We're made uh, with the capacity to carry this charism within us. If we can find it within ourselves. And that for me was the possibility that I discovered in these, in these journeys. Um, it isn't that I did end up understanding anything completely. I, uh, I don't end up a better person, I don't think. I have the beginnings of an understanding uh, that may, I hope, grow in me. So that when somebody in need comes to me the next time and stands before me, that I will have the capacity to look in the right way and to embrace that person and to give them the promise that I will go on learning and that I will be back. Thank you. Vedete che tesoro che si scopre nelle periferie. See, you can discover enormous treasures on the outskirts. They have told us about very interesting episodes and also they have told us about how you can grow personally. This dignity, this greatness of the human being, the comprehensiveness of the human being comes out through different words. John spoke about taking care of the entirety of the person. This greatness of mankind and human beings. It's not a question of uh, you know, width. It's not a question of size. It's not a question of sum of values, but depth. It's um, not a question of how many things you can have more, but it's a question of depth and meaning. John was was referring to the difference um, that he discovered uh, working with these people compared to others um, working uh, at the ends of the earth and of existence. The difference to him is that uh, in this neighborhood, uh, in these neighborhoods, uh, people are told the truth. 
and this is most important. When uh, you talk to others uh, and using the gaze that uh, John was mentioning, you tell the other, you have a value, you are worth something, you you are um, worth something independently of all the rest. Uh, you know, you're not giving a spiritual encouragement uh, to the other by saying this. Uh, we are telling the other the most true thing we could ever say. The truth on them and us. Um, truth is a judgment. Um, and Christ's gaze introduces the possibility that uh, a human being can look upon the other with this gaze and you know what it, what has to be said is simply the truth you don't have to be paternalistic uh, in your attitude towards the others you have to actually tell them the truth and this is enough to start everything from scratch and uh, clarify things if you say you have a value you are worth something then um, this makes people understand uh, what to aim at, uh, where to put energy in, uh, the person can decide. You know, this judgment is true. It, it's got a weight, even an economic weight. And this dictates uh, criteria and also behaviors. It's impressive. It's impressive because if you keep uh, the bar at the same level, uh, if you understand that the problem is that of um, generating greatness, a great human being, a person who realizes that he or she is worth something as uh, Amparito realized, etc. Now, if you focus on this, everything becomes simpler. In spite of the difficulties you encounter in um, working the way they do, you can imagine how difficult it is, yet if you keep this in mind, everything becomes clearer and more uh, transparent. You know, the crumbles uh, we can uh, give these uh, people uh, are not what we should focus on. We have to give them greatness. We have to be happy to see people flourish, uh, whether they, their name is Amparito, Silvia, or a young boy saying that he would like to be the president. You are happy because you see human beings flourish. You're not giving these people crumbles, but you are sowing seeds in them. Seeds resemble crumbles, but they are completely different. Just a couple of reflections I would like to add to what has been said so far. This way of working has a clear point of origin. This was said by Stefania and reiterated by John. This gaze which comes from the presence of Christ in history and this opens up a question. This leads to a question that our friends from AFSI have asked themselves very often, does this method work? Does it work all the time? Can it be a road to follow in all cases, or is it just uh, true for women uh, for a certain country, or is this something which can be a standard way of doing things uh, anywhere and with anybody we have to deal with. I'm particularly fascinated by this. Um, our friends uh, are working hard at this. You don't go about by approximation here. You try out, you experiment, uh, and the fruit of the work is these people uh, that you can meet. You know, in the exhibition, you have numbers also, some figures. They look arid, more arid and dry than the faces you see in the videotapes. But if the figures tell you that 
in those schools, um, the rate of people who continue studying is uh, threefold as compared to other schools, uh, or the number of women uh, who can raise their children is much higher than elsewhere. Well, you know, this is indicative as well. It's a sign that the method works, that it is successful. You need to verify this all the time. A method has to be verified. And you know, it's a question of trial and error. You test a method as you go on, and you improve it all the time. And this is part of the fascinating work that our friends are doing by accepting the challenge, the challenge they were called to. This implies something else, as was mentioned, and I'm particularly fascinated by this because it's all true, it's true for all of us. It's a challenge for all of us. You grow, you're surprised um, if you are looked at uh, like this, uh, but all this requires time and patience. Uh, we were reminded of this also by the Pope in his uh, opening message to the meeting. In Evangelii Gaudium, and I'd like to quote a passage. This is particularly true, also with reference to the work they're doing and what John told us. I don't know how many of you were struck by that passage of Evangelii Gaudium where the Pope says, you see, time is more important than spaces. Time is more important than space, and this principle allows us to work in the long term without being obsessed by immediate results. Um, thanks to this, you can bear adverse uh, situations or changes due to the dynamism of reality. From their stories uh, and also from the exhibition, you see that their work changes um, as uh, reality dictates. Giving priority to space, uh, to the number of crumbles you can give these people may lead you to become crazy to try and solve everything immediately in an attempt to crystallize processes and stopping them. Giving priority to time instead means starting processes more than owning spaces. It means giving privilege and priority to actions that are dynamic, involving other individuals in society and bearing their fruits, relying on um, firm um, ideas, patience and time. If you just throw crumbles to people, you can easily solve a problem, but Everything stops there. If you throw seeds, you can see individuals flourish. Let me just read something, a sentence by Guadalupe, one of the women from Quito. She explained how she was helped raise her children and how she is learning to be herself. At the end she says, I didn't think I would get here and stay here like this, but this is what God put on my road. And I think that he has great things in mind for me. I think this means generating an individual. It's a bit like helping us rediscover that God has great things in his mind for us, but we need time and patience to discover them. Thank you. The exhibit For those of you who have not visited ye it yet, is in Hall C1, the catalog by John has the same title. 
you can find the catalogue in the bookshop and next to the exhibition. The title is Generating Beauty, New Beginning at the Ends of the Earth. Thank you.